Evolutionists have claimed without exception, Adolf Hitler is viewed by most people in the world as the most evil man in history. With his book, Mein Kampf, how was he able to achieve a following of millions? Dr. Bergman documents that the foundational answers can be found in the influence of Charles Darwin. Coming up next on today's edition of Origins, Hitler's Darwinian Worldview with Dr. Jerry Bergman. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Origins. My name is Don Chapman, and it's my privilege to be your host. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science, along with other important facts, to validate the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today, our guest is Dr. Jerry Bergman. He has nine earned degrees and has been a featured speaker on many college campuses and in many churches throughout the world. He has a book that he's written on this subject that we're going to talk about today. Dr. Bergman, how wonderful it is to have you here and how important this subject is. We're going to talk about Hitler's Darwinian worldview. It really was Darwin's work that influenced Hitler, wasn't it? Yeah, very much so. And a good quote which illustrates that is from a professor from University of Pennsylvania, and he said, the greater German empire was to be a racially pure empire. Germany was, they felt, the last best racial hope for mankind. Praise God, it failed. And that illustrates how important racism was sure to was. the Nazi movement. Yes. And not only the Nazi movement, I should mention, but also many of the leaders that were part of not only the Nazi movement, but other movements at this time. Yeah. So it was central to this whole area. And now to explain this a little bit more, how do you achieve this goal? How do you achieve the goal of a racially pure empire? Well, the first step is you have to expunge the Judeo-Christian Muslim doctrine of human divine origins from mainline German theology and its schools. And they did that. It basically, Hitler took over and his government took over and controlled the schools and replaced Christianity with social Darwinism. And, of course, we know that culminated in the Holocaust. infamous Holocaust. And Viktor Franco summarizes quite well. We tend to blame this all on Hitler, and certainly he deserves a lot of the blame. But as Viktor Franco, by the way, who was in the concentration camp, he was a doctor. He sure was. And he was Jewish himself, so he can relate to this. But he astutely evaluated the influence of modern scientists and academics, concluding the gas chambers were the ultimate consequence of the theory that man is nothing but the product of heredity and the environment. And he continues, the gas chamber of Auschwitz were gas chambers of Auschwitz were ultimately prepared at the desks and in the lecture halls of nihilistic scientists and philosophers. So in many ways, the blame, or at least carrying out the Holocaust, was responsibility of the academics, the scientists, and the philosophers. And the origin of the basic idea is quite accurately summarized in the title of Charles Darwin's book, it's of course, Origin of Species is the title. The subtitle is The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Now, this book did not talk about humans, but his second volume he wrote a few years later did. And a good illustration which documents this is a book published by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, which basically documents creating the master race was done by the scientific establishment. So the American Holocaust Museum is accurately pointing out that this racism goal of Nazi Germany was importantly carried out and created by the academic institutions and the scientists. And there, of course, is one of the most popular pictures of Adolf Hitler, who certainly was to blame for what happened, but on the other hand, he could not have done what he did without enormous amount of support from the academic and scientific and medical establishment. And you can see here, few resisted, an enormous amount of support from the people. This is a speech he gave before the Reichstag. And there is one of the few exceptions. There was very little opposition to what Hitler was trying to do during World War II. The primary opposition was from the Christian church, but it was far too little, far too late. And, of course, most well-known among these is Derek Bonhoeffer. And many Christians were among what they call the righteous Gentiles. And Corrie ten Boom is one of the good examples of that. 
So again, too little, too late. So if the church would have stood up and opposed this regime, we would not have had a World War II. But by and large, many were pacifist about this uh, matter. Adolf Hitler said, let me control the textbooks and I will control the state. And indeed, that was one of the major goals, was to control the academic institutions. And the goal was to indoctrinate youth, central to his policy, and then uh, to illustrate that in a letter that Darwin Galton wrote, and Darwin was his uh, relative, said, the appearance of your origin of species, written by Darwin, formed a real crisis in my life. Your book drove away the constraint from, of my old superstition as if it had been a nightmare, it was Christianity, is what he's talking about, and was the first to give me freedom of thought. The freedom of thought led him, Galton, to develop the theory of eugenics, which, of course, uh, Germany during World War II was trying to implement. How do you do that? Well, you've got to determine which people are the inferior race. And you did that by, and today we look at this and we're amazed, but they did that primarily by a lot of measurements of skulls, you can see here. Isn't that amazing? And, and eye colors. Had to have blue eyes, that was seen as the superior race. The darker the eyes, of course, the more inferior you were alleged to be. Now we know, of course, that brown eyes are superior because they give your eye more protection from the sun. And the blue eye is actually a mutation. Is a mutation, yeah. correct. Uh, blue, we all have blue eyes underneath the brown, <laughs> okay? But we don't see the brown, uh, we don't see the blue, I should say, until the brown develops. That's why a lot of newborn babies have blue eyes, and then later on the brown pigment is put upon the iris diaphragm, which is the blue. And here you can see he's using art, eye charts to determine whether or not these people are, these young men, young boys, are part of the superior race. And there, that's the ideal German uh, girl. Unfortunately, many Germans, or at least for Hitler, did not fit that ideal. So he had to compromise right from day one. And here, the ideal German soldier, Corporal Goldberg, pictured throughout Germany, uh, lauded as the ideal German racial trait. Ironically, Corporal Goldberg turned out to be Jewish, which was an enormous embarrassment for the German uh, He's government. like the, uh, the poster boy. Yeah, he was the, that's a good description. Yeah. He was like the poster boy. Yeah. I find even more interesting is, how can you tell a Jew from a non-Jew? Well, they couldn't. It was hard. So they had to wear signs which let the world know that they were Jewish. Right. And here you can see two Jews wearing the Star of David to indicate their racial background. Hitler's ideas were expressed quite well in this quote. Hitler was confident that the world would someday thank him for eliminating this rotten, parasitic race, the Jews, even if Germany had lost the war. Why did he say this? Because the Jews were a morally inferior race and it was more important to eliminate this race than it would be to win the war. And even win the war. Even win the war, which illustrates where his priorities were. Importantly, his top Nazi leaders were products of German education and science, and he had an enormous amount of support from his uh, academic uh, establishment in Nazi Germany. Goebbels, who was one of his uh, leading Nazis and also the propaganda minister, said the fear is deeply anti-Christian. He regards Christianity as symptomatic of decay, and rightly so. This illustrates very well that Hitler realized that the main opposition he had was from the Christian church. The Christian church, church taught that we are all descendants of Adam and Eve, therefore we are all equal, therefore there is no inferior race. And so this was an idea that Hitler and Goebbels later on had to oppose to achieve his goals. And Joseph Mengele, probably the most famous uh, Nazi during the World War II, he had an MD and a PhD in evolutionary biology. And the experiments he did included the study of twins. He wanted to determine if we could influence races by changing the environment. as what caused one race to appear and another race to have different traits. So that's what he was trying to do. Maybe we could make the somewhat inferior races be more superior by changing, for example, their eye color. So he experimented with things like wow. injecting dye in their eyes so they would have blue eyes. So they would go from brown to blue by this 
by this die, which of course today we recognize is absurd. And of course it uh, didn't work out very well. He also tried to determine if you could convert a person from one race to another race by various chemical or other means. Obviously that didn't work very well. Another experiment he did was vacuuming subjects' lungs until the lungs collapsed or froze the subjects to determine how long they could live in that environment. And so he used the Jews as experiments to learn more about anatomy and physiology. So some of his goals were not exactly laudable, but you could understand why he was trying to do what he was trying to do. And another example is, he. this is one of the worst, he smeared phosphorus on the Jews, then set the phosphorus on fire. The purpose was to research treating burns. The screaming was so loud they had to move the research somewhere else because it bothered the rest of the people in the camp. Now to me, all he had to do was the Germans that were injured during the war, there were plenty, he could do research on them. Why do you have to create victims to do research? You could just do research on the Germans who were burned and there was no small number who were injured as a result of the war. High altitude decompression research he did as well. He basically increased the adverse conditions until they died. So he had an idea of how much decompression the body could take before it died. And that again is somewhat unnecessary research. As a result, he ended up killing thousands and thousands of people. So you have to dispose of the bodies. So how do you get rid of all these bodies? Well, he applied science and he basically utilized techniques which we consider today repulsive for good reason in order to mass produce the deaths and then mass produce getting rid of the bodies. The Nazi goal eventually was to replace the Bible with Mein Kampf. That was his eventual goal. And Hermann Göring was second most powerful Nazi and one of the leaders of persecuting the churches. Dr. Bergen, before we talk about Göring, I think we need to take a break. But let me just ask you this. You know, when we're talking about the races, uh, not that I agree in any way, but you can understand, you can see a difference in Asian appearance and in black appearance. As you pointed out, the Jews often, there's no difference. Why this huge hatred for the Jewish people? Part of the culture, part of the background, part of the idea that as Darwinism was becoming more and more widely accepted in the scientific community, for evolution to occur, there has to be superior and inferior races. If we're all equal, there's nothing for natural selection to select from. So we have to have differences in the races so that natural selection has something to select on. So natural selection was central to evolution and thus racial and biological differences was also central to evolution. So that was necessary in order for him to verify and carry out evolution. I just think as a pastor that there's a spiritual dimension to the attacking of the Jews as well. Uh, probably is was uh, Jews but there were at least six million Jews. Yeah. And there was at least five million that were directly murdered as a result of his racial purity programs. And there were others that were killed indirectly as a result of these programs. So he was not after just the Jews, he was after the Slavics, which would be Poles, Russians, and so on. And he was also after other groups. He basically said, give me time, eventually we'll eliminate all the inferior races, all which inferior. included just about everybody except Aryans. You know, I am so grateful that God's word says that we are all created in his image and that we're all equal in God's eyes and that God is not a respecter of persons or of races. There's mm -hmm. only one race, the human race. Well, there's the rat race, but we all lose that one. <laughs> but the only real race is the human race. Yeah, and God loves us all and I'm so grateful for that. That's and true. I wish these men could have known that. Folks, we have to take a break. This is hard stuff, but it's stuff we need to hear because it shows the, the disaster of, of, uh, of evolution. And uh, when, when this lie is applied as the truth, it's not just wrong, it's dangerous. We'll be back to tell you more about that, so don't you go away. We are back on Origins talking with Dr. Jerry Bergman about his book about Hitler's Darwinian worldview. And you know, as I was listening to you, Jerry, in the first part of the show, it, the, it, the, uh, the cheap regard that Nazism showed for human life, 
that you could burn this person and starve that person and cut people up and kill one twin to see how it affected the other and all of that. Just uh, there was no regard for humanity. It was just the race. Isn't the race. that true? Yep, they focused on the race. So it was almost like if we kill these inferior beings, it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. I, I, I just, uh, I, I want our people to see that, that, you know, ideas have consequences. Clearly do, yes. And when we take an idea like this and we really build our lives on it, uh, millions die. Yeah, which uh, they did during this time. That's true. They did during this time, yeah. and uh, we're making this the, uh, the uh, instituted uh, belief in our own culture. It ought to scare us. Yep. Herman Goring, who I was mentioning a few minutes ago, he follows the pattern of so many of the leading Nazis. Namely, they were reared as active Christians. They were active Christians until they met, almost all of them, until they met Darwin. And Darwin was the step, first step, in changing them from Christians to anti-Christians and to Nazis and to eugenicists. So these pattern over and over. Now, not everybody, but almost everybody I looked at in my book on uh, Hitler, I looked at his 12 leading followers, important people that were in high command in Nazi Germany. And every single one of them, we see this occurring. Of course, Hermann Goring, you can see, he ended up committing suicide. He beat the hangman. Does this go back in their life pretty much to when they leave home and go to the university? Is that where they meet it? A lot of it. Some, sometimes in high school and higher level education, but quite often in uh, colleges and universities. They became uh, enamored with Darwinism, and this was felt to be true, and therefore they need to apply it to society. This is the natural consequences. Many said all Nazism is is science applied to society, and indeed it was. And, of course, uh, Heinrich Himmler is a good example, who was a study biology in school was a chicken farmer for a while until he became a Nazi and he really thrived. And he was the one actually who led many of the uh, concentration camp events, directed what happened in the concentration camp. So he was kind of over the camps. He was central, yes, to, to the, the conditions that occurred in the camps. Were the gas chambers his idea? And, well, several people's idea. The problem with the gas chambers was when we've killed so many people, how do we economically dispose of the bodies? And so the idea of gas chambers was to, number one, effectively kill them, because they realized shooting them wasted bullets, wasted time, and some of the soldiers had a hard time murdering innocent people. Hmm. So they developed the gas chambers as a more, they said, humane, more humane way of killing more people more effectively. And that's how the gas chambers were developed. By, by the way, the scientists. The scientists were the ones that were behind the production of the uh, building of the gas chambers and uh, utilizing a gas to uh, kill the large numbers of people very quickly. And I can mention they were deceived when this happened. They were told, you're just going to take a shower, no problem. Right. Tie your shoes, put your shoes by the door, hang your clothes up, keep them together, because when you get out, then you'll have to dress, you'll have to put your shoes on, and you don't want your clothes to be separated. So they were really misled until they got in the gas chambers, the doors were locked, and then they realized what was happening and then, by then, it was too late. When life becomes cheap, truth doesn't have much value either. Uh, that's very, very true. Very true. Okay. And so the, look at the confidence in his face in that official picture. He just acts like he knows everything and knows how to run the world. Very confident. And uh, you can see his, his concern was uh, directing the killing of six million Jews. And that's about how many were killed in the camps, plus about 200,000 and... 500, half a million Romani. And so there were not just the Jews as we mentioned, but there were other groups as well. Sure. Romani would be gypsies. Yeah. That's what they uh, called them. And of course, we have the ending of Himmler as well. He ended up uh, dying in the, uh, at his own hands, committed suicide. So many of these guys had, took their life before they had to pay the piper. They did. And Goebbels, same thing. Yeah. Joseph Goebbels, the, one of the most outstanding propagandists in Nazi Germany. And he not only took his life, but he also uh, poisoned all of his children. They all died. He had, I think, seven children, and they all died. And probably the worst Nazi was this young man here, uh, Julius Stryker. And he was one of the most militant anti-Jews as well as pro-Nazis. And you can see he published this paper here, which is uh, widely circulated, uh, Der Sturmer. And uh, one 
result, of course, of this was horrible destruction never seen before in history. This is Cologne, and you can see the cathedral in the center, and you can see uh, other pictures as well that pretty much the entire city was destroyed. And the same thing is true with most of the cities in uh, big cities in Nazi Germany. This was Hamburg, and you can see there's not much left of the city at all. Part of that is Hitler, uh, because he was so ideologically driven, um, the destruction of his whole nation didn't seem to bother him. It was like, as long as the idea doesn't die, it doesn't matter if we destroy the whole country. Is that true? That's true. Toward the end of the war, when it was very clear that, that Germany was losing, Hitler had a choice. Put all your effort toward winning the war, A, or B, put all your effort toward killing the Jews. And as a result, towards the end of the war is when many of the Jews died. And his generals said to him, we need men at the front lines, we need the soldiers, the trains, we must be focusing on the war in Russia. Hitler said, no, we're going to focus on killing the Jews. Therefore, the men, instead of fighting in the war, they were used to transport the Jews, primarily from Hungary, to the concentration camps. And that took a lot of manpower and effort and money, etc. When should have been, according to Hitler's generals, been expended in the war, fighting the war. But nope, Hitler made it clear what was more important. At least if I eliminate the Jews and a few of the other inferior races, I will have done something important, which he felt the world would eventually recognize how important this was, and they would reward him for his work in elimination of the Jews, the Romani, and the Slavics, or at least as many as possible. I know his hatred for Bonhoeffer kind of illustrates that same point, that you could hear the gunfire from the Allied forces, but he was determined to hang Bonhoeffer before the concentration camps were liberated, mm -hmm. almost like a personal vendetta. That's true. Yeah. That's a good point. One summary of this is, and I'll read it here, it's an excellent summary. What Hitler attempted to do is rank alongside the most heinous crimes of history and Darwin as the father of one of the most destructive philosophies in history. And that kind of summarizes the whole Nazi movement and what Hitler tried and failed to do. And today we can see, of course, the result of that so much that Hitler, that name is uh, not a very nice name. As far as I know, not very many people in Germany or elsewhere are given that name. That name has been <laughs> reserved for him, and not many people are n naming their children. I'm not going to name any of my grandchildren at all. At all. Or no, neither one. Yep. You know, on a, on a previous show, we talked about the influence of Darwin on the communist leaders, Stalin and, and mm -hmm. Marx and so forth. And here we're talking about the influence of Darwin on Hitler. And, and, and even though... Darwin was a man who, if you went to his house and he had a nice wife and he had a nice kid and he never shot guns, he wrote with a pen, his influence for evil in the world is almost beyond our ability to comprehend it, isn't it? Oh, clearly. And as I do more and more research in this area, I'm realizing that he had influ an influence in areas I never thought possible, as we were talking about earlier, in Africa. I was where he had some influence in what happened in Africa, but... As you mentioned to me, obviously he had a great deal of influence in what happened in Africa and still affects African nations today. His influence was so profound. His influence relative to racism was so profound. Of course, the British and the colonists felt that the black Africans were inferior. Yeah, and they, they based that heavily upon they were Darwinism. They just almost animals, um, and so you use them like you would an ox or a donkey. Yeah. Yeah. Here's my question. Today... Uh, our world is, uh, especially the Western world, is, is heavily Darwinistic in what we teach our children. Mm -hmm. uh, what uh, consequences to the future do you see of that? Well, I see some of these same ideas are still with us. The main thing is, in order to learn from the past, we have to study the past. Right. Although I find among students, since I teach at a college, that there's a lot of interest in Hitler and especially the influence that he had back then and the influence he still, in some quarters, has today. And as often been said, we need to learn about the past. We need to understand what Hitler did and why and what Darwin did and why. And only that way can we make sure we don't repeat it. Your book on this subject is a tremendous book that everyone ought to read. Thank you for your work and for uh, the, the great uh, heritage you've left us, and we need to share it with everyone, especially with our children. You know, my friends, ideas have consequences. That's my bottom line for this show. 
And when we take out the truth of God's word and replace it with man's lie, as Charles Darwin did, millions died because of a lie. Let's you and I cling firmly to the truth of God's word and let's know the God who created us. And let's love everyone equally, no matter whatever differences we've seen. Because it's God's view that he created you. And it's God before whom you'll stand one day. And be sure that your worldview is consistent with God's worldview. I hope, you're, I hope the Lord blesses you, my friend. And I hope to see you again soon here on Earth.